Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jim Cagnino with Ninja Trader. Welcome to Trader's Workshop. We have a great show lined up for you today on the second day of the spring here uh, in, well, in the U.S. I'm going to call the whole country out and I guess probably the whole North northern hemisphere out. So weather's getting better. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about today, though. We have a great guest. Before we go too far, let me remind everybody, trading futures, options and futures involve substantial risk of loss not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, we have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although that could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful. Only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital, money I could afford to lose, it doesn't change my lifestyle, lengthen my retirement horizon, or overly stress me out. We make bad decisions as human beings when under stress. So be in a good spot. Uh, easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage without maxing out on those day trade margins uh, on a regular uh, basis. We will be taking a look at a real-time simulated live ninja trader trading platform today. Uh, none of this should be construed as trader investment advice. And past performance is not indicative of future results. The chat is active, folks, so appreciate it. If you want to participate in the chat, hop over to the website and hit that Get Started button, and you'll be good to go. Joining us today, Traders Workshop. Gary Norton, Gary, good, well, good morning for you. Early morning, right? Yeah, I just passed midnight, Jim. Uh, hello, and uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, so so Gary, um, in case you don't know, is with um, uh, LearnOptions.net and also with uh, the Norton Method. Uh, we've known Gary for several months now, and he's been around a long time. He's got a lot of great experience. And Gary, I really appreciate you doing this because you're in – you're literally in Perth, Australia, right? You're 12 hours ahead of us. I am 12 hours ahead and about 35 years behind at the same time. <laughs> I don't think you're behind one one iota. Uh, but I got it. I can assure you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to Perth. And, you know, we get we do have, a, you know, probably a little more presence from the East Coast of Australia with respect to customers and stuff like that. But um it's a beautiful country no matter where you're at right yeah 100 percent, it's a beautiful country both sides of it yeah for sure and are you where you know how, how long have you been there were you born there did you move there what's your background no i'm from uh i'm from a little town called london originally um and uh yeah i was born and brought up in london um so my trading career you know started in london um, and uh, both through investment banks, and I worked on the on the floor, the life floor as well as an options market maker. Um, so I moved out here uh, two thousand three. So I've been here twenty years now. Um, but yeah, spent uh, fifteen years in the city of London trading. Um, and yeah, I moved here when my kids were small, just to to bring them up in a, a different way, I suppose. Wow, that's terrific. Now, did you start on the life floor or did you start before somewhere else? Yeah, no, I started, um, so I, I left school and got a, a very junior job at a Japanese investment bank. Uh, so I was 18, uh, deferred my university place. Um, and I was lucky I got into the right market at the sort of wrong time, but the right time for me. Um, so literally six months after leaving school, uh, leaving high school, I got offered, I got given a, a full-time trading book. I was 19. Um, that was a Japanese equity warrant market. And that was just in the early months of the, the start of the crash of the Nikkei, so 1990. So that dates me. Um, and so that was my first trading job. I was 19 trading in the middle of one of the biggest crashes, you know, we've seen this, you know, over the last century, I suppose now. Um, you were out of, you were out of the frying pan into the fire right away. 100%. Um, unbelievable time to, to learn to trade, you know, and then, you know, I was trading derivatives six months before I didn't even know what a bid and offer was. Um, and I'm trading against, you know, the biggest investment banks, Goldman and Salomon, Morgan Stanley, all of those boys. It was a real, just straight into it. And it was a sink or swim. It really was sink or swim. Um, and luckily for me, I, I learned to swim. I really enjoyed it, just loved it and, and, and did well and just, yeah, just seemed to be suited to it. Um, so that was my first trading job. I did that for about three years and then went to the floor afterwards to to become a market maker of options. Okay. Okay. I so saw a market a market maker for options. And then after that, what was your next stop? Uh, next stop was uh, NatWest, the largest UK bank. 
um, to be head of their um, options, their, uh, their floor trading options, exchange traded options. So um, they were kind of like the biggest UK bank, but really underperforming in terms of options on, you know, on the exchange. They were not one of the top, I think they were outside the top 30. Um, so it was really a case of, you know, to try and build that brand up to where the, the bank should be. Um, so uh, that was a really exciting time to go into, you know, a big bank and learn from their side of things as well. Uh, match that up with what I, you know, learned as a market maker in options, realize there were some differences of knowledge there, knowledge gaps that I could fill on both sides, um, which went really well, um, you know, and, and, you know, came up with some really, you know, good ideas and built a good team and, and that went really well, really enjoyed it actually, a, a big learning pro, um, program and process for me. So when you were when you started on the floor, though, did you have access to, you know, a NASDAQ level two direct access a dome or trading ladder or no? Was it old fashioned bids and offers with it's purely in the flow pits, coming so I was trading in the pits on the floor. Um, so open outcry options as an options market maker, it was all open outcry um, on the screens. You know, in the afternoons, we just saw um, just literally the price of the NASDAQ or S&P 500. Um, didn't really know much else about what was happening there. So yeah, just purely open outcry market making. Um, and again, these are, I always say like, we'll get into talk about the DOM, but when people ask about my style or the way that I think about trading, um, you really have to go back to how I learned. You know, we learned in a, an environment that's a lot more blind than we are now. Like as a market maker of warrants, Japanese warrants, I'm trading against 12 other market makers. And I haven't got a clue at the time. I don't know what prices they're making. There's no internet. There's no screens. So the skills that we had to develop, same on the floor, the skills that we had to develop as market makers, the way we saw liquidity, the way we saw price action, and the way we saw our edge and our role, um, you know, those skills kind of have been lost a bit because nowadays people don't need to do that. But I think in, in some ways that that's lost a lot of nuance out there. Um, so learning in those environments, you know, really are, you know, hard environments, but you learn much better in that kind of environment, I think. Yeah, no, for sure. I was on the floor of the treasury bond pit, 30 year treasury bond pit at the Chicago board of trade. I'm going to give away my age a little bit, but 1980. And it was, um, it was completely different. Like you said, the, you know, the bids and offers, you had locals and you had uh, people filling paper. That was the bid and offer. And that was it. And you didn't see it 10 ticks deep, two ticks deep or anything. And it moved really, really quickly. So that was a really good lesson for me, though. I, I think I, I learned a lot. And, it, and you have you ever you didn't spend any time in the in the U.S. on the trading floor, right? No, sadly, I didn't. No, I missed that. Well, and the only reason I asked that question is because you have more American football knowledge <laughs> than anybody I know. It's 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 a, it's a you're a fan. Yeah, no, I love all sport. I I, I just love all sport. I want, well, not, not all sport. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna scrub one and or two that I don't like. Um, but I, I love American football. Got into it as a kid. Um, it kind of I, I love I love data and strategy and things like that. So it feeds into that. It's very much a strategy sport, right? But I do love it, and it's it's a great spectacle. Um, yeah, no, I really enjoy it. It's, yeah, so when I think Australia, I think of rugby, something I do not want to participate in. Yeah, no, I love here um, rugby league, the NRL, which is a brutal sport, and I do love watching that as well. It's a brutally hard sport. It would not, I would not want to play it. I think I'd be broken in half with the first tackle, and those guys are super tough. Um, uh, yeah. You know, fair respect for people who want to play that game. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, you know, you're from Chicago, right? People in Chicago love sport too. Yeah, and as we were talking earlier, I've given up completely on the Chicago Bears. Now I'm going to have to go with the next closest team, with this, which is Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, good luck with that. I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a buyer of Justin Fields over Trevor Lawrence, by the way. I have been since they got drafted. So, uh, uh, yeah, but good luck to, to both of them. But I'm not a Bears or a Jacksonville fan. I support the Dolphins, actually, for what that's worth. But uh yeah, I'm a buyer. Right. I've always been a buyer of Fields over uh, over Lawrence. So that'll that'll get some comments going straight away. <laughs> well, I might have to grow a mullet. I don't know. Mrs. Keggs might not like that though. So we'll see. <laughs> 
Um, all right. So yeah. now let's transition. So now at a certain point, you get to the screen, you discuss, you know, you, you discover a trading ladder. T tell us about that transition. Yeah. So um, I got, it was quite interesting because the live floor closed down pretty quickly. Um, and uh, there was really just a few months notice. And it was the same time that my, my first child was born. And so I took some time off, I think about um, six weeks, two months, maybe. Um, and that was literally the transition. So I missed the last week or two of the, of the live floor live. Um, and then, this, you know, the screen started. And I, I missed the first probably month of that. Um, then when I came back, you, you kind of, you know, you always have your, your peer group, your friends, the people that you, you were around, that you talked to, and trying to gauge what had happened in those first four weeks. It had been pretty um, dramatic, okay? There was just, it was such a big change, and there were so many different things happening. And what became clear was that being an options market maker, which is what I was on the floor when I left, was not, it was not going to be as easy uh, on the screens because the brokers didn't have to ring you up now on the floor. They, you know, it was quite fairly done and, and things would get split up. You would get part of the trade, but on the screens, they didn't have to. So as a smaller local, rather than, a, you know, one of the bigger funds or bigger banks, you realize that don't be, don't be a, an options market maker on the screen. So I had to move to futures. I never traded them before in that way, other than hedging my options. I'd never been a, an outright futures trader. Um, had a really good um, mentor, a friend, um, American guy, who was just a wonderful trader and a, and a really good mentor. And, you know, he led me towards it. And he, there were loads of platforms at the time on offer, um, but there was a huge difference between them, huge difference. And many of them were really, really poor. And essentially at that time, you know, there was one platform that was way above the others, but it was also, you know, four times as expensive. But he just said to me, you have to, you have to do that one. You have to buy that one. You have to use it. So transition to it. And of course, I've never seen a market like that before. Um, and I think one interesting thing just to sort of go back here is life had an after hours uh, a computerized trading. Okay. So all floor traders were used to it. It was called APT. Um, and it was you know, automated pit trading. And I think most floor traders felt that when the markets went screen-based, it would be like APT was. And we'd all used APT. But it, it turned out it was nothing like APT. Life decided that they weren't going to offer the same data. So APT showed each individual trader on a screen that was in that pit and their bids and offers. It looked like a virtual, it was like a pit. Um, and so you could see, for example, like you did on the floor, if JP Morgan were buying, you would see JP Morgan buying on APT. So most of your floor traders felt that was what was going to happen when we went on the screen, except it didn't. And about three or four months before um, Life went to computerize, they announced this new system, Life Connect, where they were going to give the data to everybody, um, but not all the data. So now the data on who was trading was like a key piece of data that was not going to be seen anymore. So that was all part of this mad transition where people were suddenly were looking at this screen and something on there that was nothing like what they'd been screen trading before. And like I say, most floor traders had traded on the screens, had no problem with it in the after hours markets. Um, and the original versions of what we would now call a DOM didn't look like this, like you're, you know, that you're going to show. They didn't look like that. Um, they didn't have the same information. Um, so I suppose for me, it was a little bit of an advantage. I'd never traded futures before. This was a new game just completely from scratch. Um, and quickly figured out a way to trade it and, and what my role was in that and how to trade it. Um, and I just loved it, actually. I, in fact, I, I say I enjoyed that, you know, uh, almost as much or even more than market making options. So I just loved it. And um, pretty much from day one, just just really enjoyed it and did well at it and just from there just continue to develop, you know, my style of trading that. Um, Got it. Yeah. And so, right. The evolution today has been pretty advanced. I, I, I was not around. I was not in the floor in the late 90s when that transition started happening, when devices and computers were starting to find their way onto the floor. I was gone by then, so I didn't have I, I have no experience with that part of it. We jumped into the brokerage business right away um, in 2000 in 1998, doing options, mostly taking orders for options trades. And then all of these first generation trading ladders for retail customers 
started to develop. And we can name a few of them here. So we're not going to freak anybody out by doing that. We had Trading Technologies. We had JTrader. Uh, my firm was, was Yes Trader, uh, Strategy Runner. You know, there was there was there was a handful of them that were early adopters. Yeah. So, yeah, there were. London too. Right. So probably a whole nother bit. I think was JTrader a, a, a London based entity? I can't remember. Yeah, a that patch, was patch systems? Yeah. 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 And that one was a long, a long, for a long period of time. And I think if my memory, correct me if I'm wrong, but Pats was one of those platforms where institutional and just retail folks would use. Yeah. There are a lot of floor guys that flat, were, were using Pats. Um, Ultimately, it, it just wasn't a good platform, unfortunately. Uh, I was in a room with some people that were using it, and I, I was making money from them. I was quite sad, actually. I, I was using um, TT, and it, it just simply was much better than them. I felt sorry for them. But to some degree, the decision over which platform you use also depended on which broker you had. So as a local, you know, you had your relationship with your clearer. Um, and that was a relationship that you generally forged over some years. It was a close relationship. And essentially what happened was that different clearers would say, well, you know, unclearer would say, I'm, you know, we've got PATS. And so if you were with that clearer, you would use PATS generally. That was it. That was the decision that was made for you. Whereas my mentor, when I came back in after those first few months, realized that, hold on a sec, you know, trading technology is much better than PATS and the others. So we all, like we were all friends, we all moved to a different clearer. And yeah. yeah, that was a massive decision. It was a big reason why I'm, I'm, you know, still here now. Right? It was because of that decision. Uh, yeah. I just don't think I would have been there as most of the past traders weren't. It, it was there was chalk and cheese between the two. Yeah, and so we at Ninja Trader, you know, Ninja Trader's platform was developed by you know by a visionary. His name was Ray Day. Ray, you know, was a trader, and he's like, hey, I could make this better. And he, you know, basically was you know, the driving force early on and created uh, the uh, not only the platform, the charts and all that stuff, but the trading ladder, the dome, um, which, you know, it's, 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 it's improved, improved over the years, but it was still darn good back in the day. And um, one, that was one of the platforms that my early firm sold also. And we're going to take a peek at that here in a minute. Um, I've used a lot of them. And I've come around circle and, and I think this is, I've probably all of them I've used, but this is probably my favorite. This is for sure my favorite and the best one. So yeah. let's take a peek. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully you guys could see this here. This is the typical view. It's right in the middle is the, is the trading ladder. I'm going to expand it a little bit wider, but a lot of traders like to see it as kind of a sliver. I'm going to go ahead and open it up a little bit, Gary, so we can see it a little better. Tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, so the, the trading DOM, so the original versions of this didn't look like this, as we just said. Um, and then essentially what happened was that, the, you know, technology firms would consult um, to, to floor locals and ask them, what do you want to see? How do you want to see it? Unfortunately for many traders, it's a little bit too late to ask those questions. But, um, you know, and I was around consulting to a couple of firms back then, 1999, 2000, 2001. Um, so the DOM, one of the things to... To, to think about with a DOM, it was created by order flow floor type traders to see the information that they want to see. Um, there are some DOMs that have developed that, that frankly, you know, have a lot of information that are not needed. There's, there's actually, it's, it's a very simple but massively powerful tool. And I think a lot of people, when you understand the history of it, why it was created, you understand the power. So what do we see here in this DOM um, is, Essentially, we've got the ES up, right? So you, you're seeing the market. you seems to have slowed for a second. Is it stopped? Oh, no, no. I froze it so people could see it. I'm going to unfreeze oh, okay. it. Yeah, well, I, you we know, go. if you just, yeah, if we get it going, keep it moving, uh, it, it's good to watch. So the, the DOM telling you, you know, we have a range of prices. The one in yellow is the last trading price, right? On the left-hand side, we see the, the, the bids. We see 10 levels there. On the right-hand side, we see the offers and the offers above. So we see the liquidity of the market. We see where it's trading. And... For order flow traders, for you know, quick day traders, um, this became you know the the, the weapon of choice, the, the the thing that we use, and it's a very powerful tool when you understand why it was created this way, and and what it does, and 
you know, behind it, you have a, a, a chart. Lots of pra- traders like to trade off charts. But uh, if you're a day trader, and particularly if you're trading on a short time frame, um, the, the DOM is by far the most powerful, most effective, and the best tool you can use. And it, for a number of reasons, which I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll go into. Um, and I think there's a, the skill of using the DOM, when you see someone use it skillfully, and trade very skillfully in and out using it. It's a very effective, very potent um, trading weapon. So just to kind of backtrack a little bit here, you mentioned uh, there's a buy, I'm gonna, I wanna just do some basic definitions. We have a buy column on the left. We have prices in the middle that are uh, stepped up by the smallest tick size uh, by increment. That's why it's called a ladder, right? It has steps up and steps down. And on the right side, we have a sell column. So let's just take the let's take the the, the buy and sell column. What what is, what do these numbers represent here on the on the buy and sell column? So what we see on let's say on on that buy side is we see the the number of contracts that are bid or you know in terms of the left hand side the buy column the number of contracts that are bid at each of those prices. So right now the highest bid is uh, eleven twenty five eleven a quarter. There's you know you can see it's changing constantly now eleven bid fifteen forty eight whatever. So you're seeing the, the various levels of liquidity, the number of contracts, not number of orders, the number of contracts that are bid on each of those price levels. And on the right-hand side in the cell column above, we see the number of contracts that are offered at each of those prices. And obviously, they're changing constantly as orders are being put in and pulled and um, you know added and pulled and the market price is changing. Right. And and so when I, you know, I like to refer to this as the order book kind of right, because we basically are glimpsing the same information that's resting at the exchange right now in, in real time. 100 percent. Yeah. And that, that is the order book that, that we can see the liquidity in this market. And what's, you know, what's really important about that as well is everybody sees the same thing. And that's really important. You know, one of the things, you know, one of the reasons why I suppose I'm here is I'm a passionate futures person, right? It's the fairest, most transparent contract for retail traders to trade. Um, and when you go and you trade on other platforms, FX platforms or whatever, you don't see a lot of this information. And everybody, depending on different platforms you're on, you're going to see different informations. Whereas with futures, everybody who's trading ES, E-mini futures right now around the world sees the same information. And that means it's transparent, it's fair, and it puts us on a level playing field. That's huge. It, you know, these sorts of little things are really huge for traders to understand if they're thinking about, should I trade futures or other contracts? Futures are far fairer, and this is one of those reasons. Yeah, and so as an example, over-the-counter Forex trading, you might have in the same market, let's just pick the Euro FX versus the US dollar, you might have seven different bids and offers. Yeah, and you know it, it will depend on what which platform you're on, right? How many different FX providers are there? There's, I don't know, 50, 60, 100 different FX platforms, right, that you might log on to. You're only going to see the information from the site you're on, realistically, okay? And they can limit what you see or they can adjust it. With futures, you know, you go through, you're not trading against the broker as you would be trading against, um, you know, any firm like that in the FX market generally. So... Everybody sees the exchange. Everything goes through that exchange. The exchanges do a great job, you know, CME, Eurex, you know, they're fantastic, you know, um, to keep an orderly, transparent, fair market. And uh, I think these issues often get overlooked when people are looking at trading markets. And the DOM gives us a great way of seeing that liquidity. Right. So the CME, as an example, would go to uh, S&P and say, hey, we want to do a deal with you. We want to list your, your, you know, your trademarked uh, index as a futures market. And they said, okay, that's fine. And it's the only, it's the only place you could trade an E-mini S&P 500 index future. Yeah. Yeah. And it's got so such they, a, a longevity, right? Such a history about it, like all of these futures contracts and the, the industry itself, very robust, very reliable industry. You know, I, I'm a passionate believer in futures markets and, uh, the way they're operated, and I think they offer some fairness here, like I said, and um, we can see that liquidity. It might sound small, but particularly when you're a short-term day trader, liquidity is a very important factor 
uh, which you know when we touch on the differences between a chart, a standard price chart, and the DOM. The price chart's not showing you the liquidity, right? But the DOM does, and that can be very important, you know, in various markets. Right. Okay. So let's talk about that order flow. I mean, what kind of clues could we get when we're looking at this order flow moving around pretty quickly? I might add. Yeah. So a couple of important things to understand if you want to trade order flow, and unfortunately, the, the term order flow has been kind of broadened, right? And there's people out there talking about order flow and, and, and styles that are not order flow. Um, so I'm going to come back to what is pure order flow trading. Pure order flow trading is in and out very, very quickly, right? And like its name suggests, it's in and out of the flow of orders. So that means pure order flow trading has to have an element of judging liquidity. So part of your judgment right now will be to look at that screen and judge the liquidity. How is it trading? How fast is it trading? How many contracts are on the bids and offers? to start to make a judgment about times that you can trade and where there can be edge for you and times that you can't trade. Um, and, you know, sort of to clear that up, any, if you're trading a style where you're holding a trade for five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, two hours, that's not order flow trading. Okay. That's some form of predictive order flow trading shouldn't be predictive. It's in and out of the order flow. And one of the, the, the key themes here about the DOM, one of the reasons why it's so powerful is when, when I teach traders, like particularly the order flow method, it's really important to, to be what I call in the now. You need to know what's happening now. It, it, it's irrelevant if an order, as an order flow trader, really, what happened five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. If we think about it, if we look at that DOM right now, and you know you can pick any moment in time, and if you wanted to... to freeze it, for example, right? Any moment in time, okay? The information on that screen is relevant now. So if we look at this, there is a certain level of liquidity there, right? So if we look on the bids, for example, it's, you know, it's 50 bid on 86, or we just change it now. So now it's double O bid on 114, 75 bid 99, 50 bid 99. That's the current liquidity situation, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you're an order flow trader, you're, you're bringing in that information, okay? <clears throat> if we roll it on, and you know we were to let it freeze and we stopped it again it, it's changed right not only the price has changed but the liquidity has changed a bit now there was a, a moment in there where the bid was about 18 lots completely different situation 18 mm -hmm. lots on the bid or 100 lots on the bid a very different situation so if you look at the offer there now on 1400 there's 14 lots on that offer okay so this is constantly changing and this is important as an order flow trader because you need to be in the now and if we think about it, the, the liquidity and the prices that were trading three minutes ago, can you remember them? Is it important? Do they matter now when we trade? No, is the answer to all of that. They don't matter now. The only thing that matters now is what's the price right now? What's the liquidity right now? Can I trade here right now? That's why the DOM is so powerful. It's why order flow traders, why I love trading using the DOM. If you look to the chart, it's telling you a bunch of history, but it's not in the now. It can't be in the now. It's not showing you liquidity. It's not in the now. And, you know, so is that, does that make sense about the power of, you know, not... So what happened two minutes ago? What was the liquidity two minutes ago? What was the price? It doesn't matter because we're not trading then. We're trading now. I need to know what the liquidity is now. So, and when I teach people, I have an expression. I say, you've got to be like a goldfish trader, you know, Forget about it. For what happened five minutes ago? I forgot. I forgot. It doesn't matter because it doesn't matter. And I actually think that's a very liberating way of trading. When you just focus on the now, you're in the moment. And if you, you know, in professional sports, um, it's a common theme in professional sports. They'll say it to every sports room. I forget what happened five minutes ago. Be in the moment. It's a really key um, uh, coaching tool in sport. You know, I coach um, soccer at, at a reasonable level here. Um, and again, key thing you're saying to your kids, you've got to forget what happened a minute ago, five minutes ago, good or bad, doesn't matter because it's not, it's not the now, right? You need to be in the moment. So uh, I, I teach and I, I very much believe that as a trader too. So this is the great thing about the DOM. You can forget what it was two minutes ago. You can't remember where the liquidity was. I can't remember what it was. What, you know, it was, I know there's a hundred block was that was 14 bid. Does it matter? No, because that's not there now. I, so, I, I love I love I, lo I love the Ted Ted Lasso role. 
right? Be a goldfish. I love that. Yeah, uh, I've never so, watched Ted Lasso. You know, it's a funny oh, thing. I love sport. I, I've never watched it. I keep hearing about him. It might be the best. Might be the best. Might might be the best show on TV, Gary. It's pretty good. Um, so he refers to be a goldfish. You know, you make a mistake, forget about it, move on. Um, so are we looking for numbers that are out of balance here on the bids and asks? Are we are we looking for changes that happen really quickly or both? Yeah, there's a bunch of information you're bringing in as an order flow trader. Okay, um, you know. It, again, we're not trying to be predictive. We're trying to well with the it's, obviously there, there are slightly different styles, right? As well. Um, so with the style I have, I, I'm really just trying to pick off weak orders, weak traders, um, and you know that's a whole complexity to explain what it is. But a lot of order flow trading is about that. Is about the ability to recognize a weak order or a poorly placed order, and to be able to pick that off. Um, and, you know, when I explain to people order flow trading, I often come back to one that a lot of people know about, which, for example, is, you know, Citadel buying Robin Hood's order flow. Okay, so we, we know that Citadel bought Robin Hood's order flow. We know that. Think about how they trade that order flow. Um, they very much are in and out of those orders very quickly. Uh, are they weak orders? Yeah, 100%. That's the reason why they bought them, right? They know that most of those traders are not very good traders. So they know a lot of those orders are going to be weak orders, poor, poorly placed orders. So it ticks that box as well. Um, another important point, some people, there are some styles that people are calling order flow, which are based on levels. You know, if it reaches this level where there's high volume or whatever, that's not order flow trading. Again, if we go back to Citadel and those people, they can trade at any price at any time. If it's a poorly placed order, it doesn't matter. And if you are a pure order flow trader, like I could trade on any one of those prices on that ladder right now, any one of them. If if it was the right time, if it was the, the you know, the, the things that I need, I don't need to trade at a certain, I'm not looking at thinking, oh, um, 1800s, some sort of level, big volume, I want to trade there. No, I can trade anywhere up and down that ladder, which is, again, very powerful. The more opportunities you have to trade, it, it is an advantage, you know, in the professional industry, frequency is very much valued, right? If you put, the more times you can trade, we value higher frequency. So, so, you know, again, to say, which, if I can trade on every one of those prices on the ladder, which potentially I can, that's powerful. Whereas someone that says, I'm looking for this level where there's volume or where there's something, which might be, you know, uh, 18 double over, right? I'll, I'm, I'm on a trade there. He can only trade there and he has to wait until it gets there. You know, and I could, so we could if, sit here now, we might have a cup of tea. It might not happen. So... <laughs> Cup of tea sounds good. So if we're if you are if you're looking to establish an order, right? You're looking to enter, right? You want to you want to establish a position. You're going to do it within the scope of these of of uh, what you see in the bid and the offer, right? You're not going to go down here. You're not no. going to go way up here. You're it, this is your frame of reference, right? These these ticks that you see right here. Yeah, hundred percent. I want to be filled quickly, and I want to be in and out quickly. Um, so again, I'm judging, uh, and with my style, for example, I'm judging my exit liquidity um, before I've even entered the trade. Um, and, and again, if you think about like some people call order flow styles and they're in the trade for 10 minutes or half an hour, but if you think about it, you, know, you may have done some analysis of order flow or volume, I think is what normally they're looking like, not order flow, but they, they call it volume. They call it order flow, but it's volume. But you may make some analysis of that right now when you put the trade on. But if I'm holding it for half an hour or 10 minutes even, I have no idea what the liquidity will be like or the order flow when I exit. So that cannot right. be order so, flow trading. So, so you're in, I mean, your trades, the duration of your trades might be seconds, if, seconds. if even that. Yeah, 100% seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, to be non-predictive. So again, in a professional industry, we tend to value certain styles so high frequency non-predictive i think if you want like careers in this industry and, and that's what, again look at even a big fund like citadel they're going into buying this order flow why they're making sense on every trade a couple of cents a couple of cents high frequency non-predictive when they trade against the retail order you know somebody puts an order in to buy x you know microsoft shares or whatever price when citadel take the other side to that They'll be out of that trade within a couple of seconds, right? They're not sitting there taking the other side and running it for the next half an hour. Now they're in and out for a couple of seconds. In the professional side of the industry, we value 
frequency, high frequency, and non-predictiveness. If can we find a method of trading? If you're in and out in a couple of seconds, then uh, I'm not trying to predict where this market's going. Um, and you know that's based on the assumption or the view, basically, which is what I have and a lot of pros have is I actually have got no clue where this market will be in ten minutes. And you know, I, I'm just to be that honest with myself and say I don't know where this will be in ten minutes. I'm not going to try and guess. I'm not going to play that predictive game, which is what I think a lot of people mistake this industry for. They think it's about prediction. There's a lot of styles of trading that don't need prediction. In and out, quickly at the DOM. Um, and the DOM's the perfect way. One click trading, you can be in and out within a second or two. And then you can find another trade, you know, 20 seconds later, potentially. Find lots of those little one tick, two tick trades. And they add up. Um, that's the, the kind of style we're looking for. So let me ask you this. So we've been watching the trading ladder for a while and, you know, we've been, we've been bouncing around a little bit in a small range, kind of a small range right now. And would you like, look at any individual print? Let's say, let's just say, I don't know, 4014 even, and, um, kind of remember that that we've spent some time there. And as we bounce up to 15 and then back down to 14, back to 13, back to 14, would you put more weight on that 14 print because it keeps going back there or no? No, I try not to. So I think it's quite important to try and literally be in the moment. So there are, that's a, it's a great point, Jim. A lot of people have that kind of a view, right? It's very common in the retail industry to look for this level, this area that they think the market's being attracted to. And what I say is make a decision based on now. You know, it may have come back to 14 a number of times, but now the liquidity might be different. Now the context might be different to the last time. And I'm always open to the fact that this time might be different. I just react and trade what I see now. And I, again, I think that's very powerful. And I think if traders can do it, it it's it just forget that before, before what happened right now, what do you see? And if I ever get, you know, a student or someone I've ever or whatever, struggling, I just break it down and say, what do you see right now? Just what do you see right now? What does that tell you? And that by doing that, you're in the moment. I think it actually, I think those that are using past levels at times, they're going to trade the wrong context. You know, five minutes ago, that, that was happening, but then there may have been some news. There may have been something else. There may have been, anything could happen. If you're in the moment, you'll be trading what's happening now. Whereas if you traded from before, you know, and there has been some news or some event or something happened, you're going to be trading what you saw before. So that's what I love about the DOM. It keeps me in the now. And obviously it's a little bit quieter now. It's midday. So it isn't moving so much. So probably we can, we do know that it's been trading between you know, 11, 16 or whatever. It's been quite a tight range. So that's at lunchtime, it's easy to do that. But if you go onto the open, for example, and it's jumping around and it's moving a lot or on a busier day or if you had any queue up or whatever, um, you, you won't remember where it was five minutes ago. I think that's really powerful. I think I can just look at my screen right now. What's the thing? Is there something for me? Can I trade here? Yes, no. Okay, move on. And if it's a no, the other great thing is that it's going to be changing every second, right? Every fraction of a second. So, you know, if this is a no for me right now, I can't trade here, I can't trade here, I can't trade here. I just have to keep watching, keep focused. And then, you know, within a few seconds, I'm, I'm possibly going to get something to trade. Whereas if my level is 18 double O, like we said before, I could be sitting here on my hands with my cup of tea or whatever, two hours waiting for it, waiting for it, waiting for it. And like, as I said, professionals, we, we value the idea of frequency. Can we do something where I am going to be trading a bit more? Uh, and I think for oh. a, sorry, go ahead, Jim, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Finish the thought and I got a question. I was just going to say, like, I think for, for retail traders at home, you know, who sometimes worry about it, they're always looking for the, the big money trades, right? The, can I make 30 ticks or whatever? And I'm just going to be honest and say, I don't know where the market's going to be in 10 minutes, right? I haven't got a clue. I'm not trying to play that game. The idea of these, you know, by trading small, you are protecting yourself. Retail traders have smaller accounts. I think it should lend them even more to trading just for make, you know, making a couple of ticks, a couple of ticks, um, and, and right. just keep grinding, just keep grinding. Even in a one lot, you know, you can grind a one lot, you know, make, make two ticks, make two ticks, make a tick. You can grind that 40, 50 times in a couple of hours 
It's a, it's a, it's a good use of capital. You're protecting yourself because if you're in and out in a couple of seconds, the chances of you carrying a four hundred, five hundred dollar loss, or you know whatever, is, is is reduced to the smallest it can be reduced to. And all of these things, so, you can still grind that one not hard. Sorry, Jim. No, that's okay. I got gotcha. you. I, I, I hear you. So, um, you know, I hear a lot of traders say, "Look at a book, look at the depth, and say, let's say, for instance, uh, the thirteen twenty fives there." instead of a hundred, just pretend there was 500 there. Right. And then they'll say, well, look at, look at how, how big, how big the offers are there at 500. That's, that's meaningful. That means, that means there's some big players involved that aren't going to let this thing go past there. And this is where I want to get short. Also, is, is there anything to that idea? Uh, I would caution against making those views. Um, so the way I do, so again, this was one of the big, things that we had to to change when we transitioned from the floor where we knew who was trading. It was a very different environment. You knew JP Morgan was mm -hmm. coming in. It wasn't very hard to figure out pretty quickly what was going on behind the scenes. It was a small world, right? Now, I look at it, and again, like I, I assume that I don't know where this market will be in, in 10 minutes' time because I don't. So if I see an order like that for 500 lots, the only thing I can say with certainty that, with that is there's more than likely to be a big player playing there. Now, what he wants to do and why he wants to do it, I actually don't know. And I think it's really important for traders to know what you don't know, right? And that's, there's a bit of an old Donald, Donald Rumsfeld quote there, isn't there, about no knowns and no unknowns and things like that, right? This is a, a known unknown. I know there's a big trader there. I know there's a big player, but I don't know what he's doing. So usually for me, that would be a sign, that would be something to stay out. Okay, that would be somewhere to stay out. Um, again, I try to pick off smaller traders. I try to avoid bigger traders. And again, I, I, a lot of the, the thing that I do, my style is very opposite to what a lot of other people do, which I'm happy with, frankly. I, I don't want to be doing the same with everybody else. But yeah. the idea of trying to work out what the big guys are doing and join them, I just sit here behind the screen like this and think, I don't know what the big guys are doing. I, I can't figure it out. I know that they play. I've been that before. Right? I've been the big guy at the bank. And I've often said this quote, and I don't think I got this from Ted Lasso. I haven't watched Ted Lasso. I don't think Ted Lasso got this from me. But um, I've said this to people that if on this intraday, very short-term basis, right, if you can find, if you think you can figure out what a big trader is doing, either you're wrong or he's rubbish. And you should never, <laughs> we should never look to get on board with big traders who are rubbish. And not all big traders are good, right? We see that all the time. We see, you know, so if you can figure out what they're doing, you know, then you either you haven't or he's not very good. So, so uh, I, I, to so play that game. I, I, I hear you. I hear you. We're getting close to the end here, but I just wanted to pull up uh, a micro NASDAQ contract. And yeah. um, I wanted to ask you this question. Um, I'm going to freeze it for a second. So notice the the bids and asks are a lot smaller, right? And sometimes there's a gap between the, the bid and ask, right? So there's you know, potential for slippage and that kind of thing. Would would you embrace this kind of market or or stay yeah. away from it? Hundred percent. No, I, I, this is the kind of market that that, that I would embrace. Yeah, hundred percent. This is where mistakes yeah. happen. Weak orders are placed. The people playing it, smaller, weaker traders. Um, this this yeah, I, I like this kind of market. Um, most people don't have the skills, frankly, to trade it. Um, not in this way. So the ladder, the DOM here is just a perfect tool to to use to, to trade this kind of market. Again, you can't use a chart. A chart doesn't show you this, but the DOM, you look at that, you can, yeah, you can make some great trades. But of All course, right. if I, you I, get I, it wrong, like you know, these markets, if you get them wrong, you're in a bad way. But you know, the, my style is designed to try and pick off those traders that are wrong. Right, right. Well, I thought you were going to answer that way. And so it doesn't, from my point of view, it doesn't matter if you trade like I do, like slow, like a turtle and be patient or like you do quick and nimble, uh, the Ninja Trader trading ladder and software is perfect for you. I mean, you could, you can get it done. So I'm good. Thanks, Jim. Anyway. All right. So we're, we are close to the end here. Um, and I do want to give everybody an opportunity to kind of, uh, figure out how they could reach out to you if they want to reach out to you. What's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? Um, 
I've got uh, GaryNorton.com is just a website about me. I'm on Twitter. Um, don't I don't tweet a lot. I'm not a big, big Twitter, but Gary uh, underscore Norton. Um, and then for those interested in options, LearnOptions.net um, and NortonMethod.com is uh, features. Very awesome. Well, I really, I really appreciate. We really appreciate you being uh, part of the show today, taking time out uh of your busy schedule in the middle of the night i might add but I, I meant to ask you that we're going to go a couple another minute so we, if you trade the u.s markets you 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 know you you have to adjust your you know your internal clock a little bit right yeah so my day here is essentially you know from it's a sort of bookended day right early morning uh is you know, I, I'm generally quite busy, so sort of six thirty to about nine or ten, which is the end of the your e e afternoon evening kind of thing. Um, and then I kind of my day is most of the middle of the day is to myself, and then the evening generally gets you know busy again. So it's a it's not a great time zone to be fair for um, per um, for that perspective. But yeah, it's sort of bookended. So uh, um, yeah, and you do and is and you and you'll you'll also do some Eurex futures, right? Yeah, you're ex, I'm, you know, big, big fan of, of their products over the years. Um, and yeah, the, the DAX has always been a really cool, cool product. It's more like this, right? It's very busy, very, a lot of people struggle with it. And you look for that, right? If, if a lot of small traders are struggling on a contract, that means there's opportunity. Um, so if you can figure out why they're struggling, what their issues are, what their mistakes are, you can learn to try and pick them off. So um, yeah, I've always really enjoyed the DAX as well. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time. Next time we'll do some chart comparisons with the dome side by side, stuff like that. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated, very interesting um, and a unique point of view uh, with a strong background from our presenter today. Gary, thank you for being here. I greatly appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. All right, folks, hopefully we'll see you at bars closing this afternoon. Um, in the meantime, I do want to uh, remind everybody the most important message, be safe out there. Be good to each other. Thanks for coming.